from the streets of New York City, Morgan's Policy Radio. Here's Pierce Redman. Okay, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Porkins Policy Radio. As always, I am your host, Pierce Redman. You can find the show here at Ocelli.com, as well as on my website, which is PorkinsPolicyReview.com. If you are new to the show, there are lots of ways to listen. You can, of course, find uh, everything archived on my website. You can find all of the new shows archived over at Ocelli.com. You can follow the RSS feed on my website. You can get email updates as well. I am on iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, Google Play, Podbean, Player FM. Uh, pretty much all minor and major podcatchers will have the podcast. And uh, if there are some that you use that I don't mention on the show, please do let me know so we can link up to it on my website and uh, give a little shout out to that as well. Uh, I am also on YouTube, so if you like the show, you can always subscribe to my YouTube channel. If you do like the show, uh, and if you listen on YouTube, definitely give a, a thumbs up, uh, maybe leave a nice comment. If you uh, listen on iTunes, uh, please do leave a rating and uh, as well as a review. That helps uh, tremendously in uh, getting traffic to the site and uh, people uh, getting interested in the show. If you uh, enjoy this show, if you like the work that you hear, if you like uh, all of the various topics that I cover, if you like uh, some of the, the, the side pod, uh, pod, bleh, the side podcast projects that I am involved in, then you can support me and uh, by going to patreon.com slash Pierce Redman, and you can sign up for as little as a dollar a month, and that single solitary dollar, of course, gives you access to the exclusive bonus podcast that comes out every month. Uh, it's a, a really fun uh, a way to uh, support me. You also get, of course, extra content. We do interviews. Uh, sometimes I do solo shows. Sometimes they're a little bit lighter than uh, some of the, the regular topics that we cover on the uh, the, the podcast here. Uh, sometimes they're, you know, funny, uh, they're all sorts of different things. Uh, and also, I do have a PayPal uh, button, so if you just uh, go to my website and you can click on the PayPal uh, button logo, and you can uh, make a one-time donation, you can make a recurring donation if you want to, so uh, definitely uh, use, you know, if you don't like Patreon, uh, you can always sign up through PayPal. And uh, most importantly, though, if you really love the work that I do and you want to support me in an even larger capacity then I encourage you to go to ocelli.com and you can click on the donate button uh, that uh, Chuck has up on the website that will uh, bring you over to PayPal. And you can also support Chuck on Patreon. Uh, Chuck has a Patreon and it is just patreon.com slash ocelli. So uh, two uh, very unique ways to support me and the work I do. And again, I, I, um, I'm not saying this, uh, just because uh, Chuck is my uh, my producer, but uh, I really do encourage people to support Chuck and everything because he, of course, makes it possible for me to do the live show. Uh, very quickly, I just want to uh, plug a few little things before we get into the first hour. So I uh, just want to plug uh, the uh, previous episode, last week's episode, uh, episode 185 that I did with Jenna Orkin. Um I just think it was a, a really good show. Uh, I don't, and I don't usually pat myself on the back, but the, that was a really good conversation. I think we covered a lot of ground. I was able to uh, uh, get Jenna to, to, you know, stay on the line for a little bit longer uh, than we uh, originally anticipated. And I think we we did a tremendous service in terms of uh, the health effects from the World Trade Center dust and the environmental impact of the. Uh, World Trade Center collapsing, and we just covered a, a, a ton of ground. And I think it's a it's a subject that doesn't get nearly enough attention. Jenna Orkin is a journalist that I think doesn't uh, get nearly enough attention as well. Uh, so definitely check out last week's episode. Lots of good information in there. Uh, I also want to um, uh, plug uh, a episode I did. For good friend uh, of the show, Mike Swanson's new show, a uh, podcast that he does called The Past American Century. I think that will be posted uh, probably this coming Sunday. So uh, it should be up on uh, Sunday the 19th. Uh, really fun episode we did. It's about like an hour long, maybe a little bit longer than that. 
Uh, we talked about QAnon and uh, the, the sort of uh, the, the history of it, how it's kind of taken over. We, we got into some of the, the kind of culty, undue influence aspects of QAnon as well. So uh, definitely a, a good uh, discussion of keeps popping up every time i think it's disappeared uh it comes uh back up again and um if you you know if you listen all the way to the end uh, i i talk about uh, a really interesting personal experience uh that i had uh, related to q and on uh, illustrate uh how much um you know this is this story has permeated well beyond the conspiracy culture into everyday life so definitely keep an eye out for that uh, also, uh, keep an eye out. Uh, there should be an episode. Um, hopefully, Robbie Martin and I will be recording it soon uh, for Media Roots Radio. And uh, I won't, uh, you know, talk too much about what we're going to be covering. But uh, definitely keep an eye out for that episode. And also for this month's bonus podcast, I hope to actually have Robbie Martin on, and we're going to do a film review of a very interesting movie that a listener. Uh, Dark Alliance is the uh, the listener, uh, longtime supporter of mine on Patreon. He actually sent me a DVD of this film, Bob Roberts, which is a truly phenomenal. Uh, it was a film I had no pill. Dark Alliance sent it to me, and uh, we're going to be covering that hopefully on this month's bonus podcast. Also. Here in the first hour, the phone lines are open. So if you want to call in and uh, ask me a question or a comment, if you want to complain about something, if you want to talk about something completely off topic, to 319 527 When you call in, it will be put on hold, and then uh, we will bring you on to the call. Once again, that number is 319-527-5016. But uh, I do uh, have uh, something. I should note that in the second hour, we will be joined by uh, amazing journalist Ken Silverstein, who, of course, is uh, one of the original founders of Counterpunch, uh, as well as the founder, editor-in-chief, uh, and the CEO of WashingtonBabylon.com. So um, let's uh, dive into uh, today's uh, topic at hand. Um, and that is, uh, it, it, I wanted to talk about a country that even geopolitically aware people uh, don't really discuss or, or focus on. I think that most people, even those that, uh, you know, are, are quite well versed in uh, geopolitics and geography in general, uh, would be hard pressed to find it on a map. And that is the landlocked West African nation of Burkina Faso. And uh, this has uh, been in the news slightly uh, over the last couple of weeks. And certainly uh, last Sunday, it was in the news. And we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. But uh, for those uh, who, who might be struggling to find Burkina Faso on a map right now, it is, uh, as I said, it's a landlocked West African nation. To the north is Mali. Uh, Niger is to the east of Burkina Faso. Uh, Benin is uh, to the southeast. Togo and Ghana to the direct south. And Cote d'Ivoire to the southwest. So uh, hopefully that will uh, help everybody uh, find it on a map. Um, now, last week, French special forces conducted a raid to free two French hostages that were being held by an unidentified group in Burkina Faso. The hostages uh, were uh, two French nationals, uh, one by the name of Laurent Lassimoulas, I'm sure I'm butchered that already, and Patrick Piquet. Uh, now, they were being held um, in Burkina Faso after being abducted uh, while on safari in Benin. And I believe that that did, that made the news, that they had been captured. Uh, the guide that was uh, bringing them on safari was murdered. Uh, his body was found, um, I think, uh, pretty brutally. And uh, th so, you know, obviously French special forces were working on uh, trying to get them out. And uh, when 
uh, evidently when they did uh, go and rescue them, in addition to these two French uh, nationals, they also found two unidentified women. One is a South Korean woman uh, and another American woman. Their names are not out there. Uh, the South Korean woman has been pictured in uh, some of the photos along with the two Frenchmen that were kidnapped uh, while in Paris. Uh, the American woman, uh, I don't know anything about her. I've seen no pictures of her. I, I, I believe some of the reporting said that she was close in age to the South Korean woman that was um, uh, abducted as well. And she looks like she might be in her 50s or early 60s, something like that. But uh, I'm, I'm terrible at telling age. Now, uh, it says that the, the two women uh, who appear to have been traveling together were abducted in Burkina Faso on their way to Benin. So presumably right on the border. Uh, I, I think the two French hostages uh, were probably also very near to the border between Benin and Burkina Faso. Uh, the two women appear to have been traveling together but uh, there's no indication if they knew each other previously, if they just happened to meet up while on vacation. So uh, there's still uh, some very kind of hazy details about all of this. Now, during this raid, which, uh, again, this uh, was uh, it happened last week, and I don't specifically know off the top of my head when the actual raid took place. And to my knowledge, I think that... Uh, much of the reporting doesn't uh, say exactly when the raid took place. That that shouldn't be a surprise or anything like that. Um, you know, the, the, the French uh, special forces, the uh, Ministry of Defense isn't going to uh, announce to the world when uh, a raid is happening or when it did in fact happen. But we do know, as I said, that uh, when they went, they were surprised to find these two other women that were also being held uh, because, interestingly, the U.S. and South Korea appear to have been completely unaware that these two women had, in fact, been kidnapped. There were no uh, reports of this. Uh, there was no media, you know, uh, rumors uh, about the, the kidnapping. Uh, according to Vox, uh, and I'll, I'll link up to all of the uh, articles that I'm, I'm going to be talking about, of course, in the show notes. But Vox reported that U.S. intelligence was providing support to the French military, but they had no idea that there was, uh, in fact, an American hostage. So very interesting. Now, uh, two French soldiers were killed during the operation. Uh, and um, the two Frenchmen and the Korean woman are now, as far as I know, are still in Paris. Uh, the Korean woman might have uh, might have flown back to, uh, uh, I believe she is from a small town outside of Seoul. But uh, I, the American woman uh, flew to the U.S., again, uh, unidentified. Now, um, why is this uh, interesting? Well, as I said, Burkina Faso is a, a country that doesn't get very much attention in the news. Uh, so I was, it was interesting, uh, when I did see that this was, uh, you know, it was one of the, the, my like trending news stories on Twitter was that, uh, these people had been rescued. And, uh, Burkina Faso again is, is a country that is, has undergone, uh, a lot of political strife and infighting. There's been uh, uh, an uptick in violence, much of it uh, being perpetrated by uh, the, the typical kind of shadowy jihadi groups, uh, extremist, uh, fundamentalist Islamic groups. But there's also just a, a fair amount of, um, I, I think, just kind of general uh, in low intensity violence. And it's important when we're looking at this story, that the group that kidnapped these people is, has still never been identified. They, they may very well not be a part of, a, you know, some Al Qaeda affiliate uh, or, or a, a various a jihadi group that operates in this area. But we'll get to that in just a moment. Why is it important, though, is there is, um, as I said, there is this uptick in violence. There has been this this general trend not only in Burkina Faso, but in much of West Africa, of violence, kidnapping, uh, attacks, bombings, uh, stuff like that. And 
as I think we'll we'll kind of uh, explain a little bit later, I think that this is actually linked to a much larger problem, and not that it's it's part of some broad-reaching agenda by uh, you know any any one particular group, but there are certainly groups out there. The neoconservative movement, uh, or what's, you know, however they're, they've reinvented themselves, I think are, uh, definitely exploiting this. There are certainly economic interests that are exploiting the violence. And to me, it, it paints a much larger, more complex picture about the state of affairs that we see ourselves in and possibly, uh, points towards, uh, future problems. So I think that's why it's important to talk about Burkina Faso. It is this, uh, like I said, it's it's a, a country that many people are, are never aware of. <laughs> they they could not find it on a map. Uh, they they wouldn't know basically anything about Burkina Faso, um, other than maybe the fact that it, it it's a former French colony. They um, you know the the Burkina Faso uses the the um, the CFA franc, which is the uh, currency that many former uh, French colonies um, in Africa use. It's a currency that's completely controlled by Paris uh, and has definitely led to a stranglehold on the economies of all of the countries that uh, use it. It is ostensibly uh, printed now in uh, Dakar, in Senegal, the, the CFA franc, but uh, for many, many years it was actually uh, still printed in France itself and then uh, flown into these various countries. And because it is controlled by the Central Bank of, of uh, France, there are actually uh, representatives, French representatives, uh, in, you know, inserted into the central banks of all of the various countries that use this particular currency. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're basically just a, a form of, uh, uh, you know, new colonial control. Or really, it's just regular colonial control that uh, never really escaped. But as I said, there's, there's a lot of interest and stuff in Burkina Faso, and I think that it is uh, reminiscent uh, or it illustrates the much larger problem that we face. So diving a little bit beyond this, um, why why are we talking about this raid? Uh, listen, it, it's a it's a sad reality. Tourists get kidnapped you know, fairly frequently. Um, not that, you know, we should be afraid to travel anywhere, really, even to uh, places like Benin or Burkina Faso. There is a tourist industry there. Uh, it is definitely for uh, slightly more adventurous tourists, I would say. But people do travel to West Africa. Obviously, these four people were uh, traveling around to West Africa. But while they were there, uh, the, it was reported by the BBC that that they, you know, there was reason to believe that the group that had held these four people were getting ready to cross over into Mali, uh, which I said is just to the north, and they were going to hand over the hostages to uh, a a group that um, I, I'm sure most people don't know about. I barely know about them. Uh, they are called the Masina Liberation Front. They also go by uh, K- Katiba or Katibo Masina. It's uh, it is an Islamic uh, jihadi group, uh, for lack of a better term. Uh, the the Masina is a, a region um, in uh, uh, Mali. Uh, they are also an affiliate of Ansar Din. Now Ansar Din is a Mali-based jihadi group. They are um, fairly, you know. I don't know, large or, or big. Um, they uh, they have ties to all sorts of other larger uh, jihadi groups, uh, you know, including uh, Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb uh, and others. And Ansar Din and uh, Katiba Masina, the 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 MLF, they actually came to prominence in 2012 during the uh, Northern Mali conflict. Now, this uh, conflict emerged, and I've spoke about this before on the podcast. This uh, conflict emerged after Atete, the uh, president of Mali, Amadou Toumane Tori, was ousted in a coup d'etat over his poor handling of the uh, deteriorating political situation in the north. And people, um, if they can remember back when uh, Amadou Toumane Tori 
was actually ousted by a low ranking, uh, I want to say he was like a colonel or something. Uh, of course his name is now escaping me. Uh, but this, you know, low ranking, uh, you know, officer who overthrew Amadou Tumanitore was actually, uh, trained in the United States, uh, for a brief period of time. And that was, if people can remember back in 2012, there was a lot of that going around. Uh, there were, you know, there were other little incidents around West Africa, uh, where low ranking, uh, officers, colonels and stuff like that were trying to overthrow, uh, leaders, uh, some of them that had been there for many, many years. But of course it was funny because when, uh, uh, Amadou Tumani Tori was ousted, again, over his poor handling of the North, it only led to more extremist groups like Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, Ansar Din, and a lot of uh, Tuareg nationalists taking control of northern Mali. Tuaregs are a people um, that um, are, uh, they actually stretch all over um, large parts of Algeria, Libya, Niger, Mali, and even in the very north of Burkina Faso. Uh, now, there, uh, and, and the, the, again, I don't want to get too lost in the weeds with all of that. People can go back uh, to some of my older episodes where I talk about Mali and, and the, the Tuareg people, their role in all of this. But it, um, you know, for a while, um, Mali was sort of this like lawless area in the north. And it, to an extent, it still is. But, um, you know, people, like, uh, big, some of the big towns, uh, like Timbuktu, for instance, were completely overrun by Al Qaeda linked groups or certainly groups that, uh, the media linked to Al Qaeda. Again, it, it's really, you know, on Sardin saying that they, you know, they have ties to AQIM is okay. I mean, anyone can say anything, especially when we're talking about, uh, a nebulous group like, a you know, jihadi factions running around West Africa. But anyway, um, what did this do? Well, it opened the door for France to essentially reestablish its complete dominance over much of its, its, its former West African colonies. And at the time that it happened, you know, I, I had, uh, I threw out all sorts of, uh, um, theories or, or explanations and stuff that that's, you know, that's what was really going on. And of course I wasn't the only one doing this, but again, low ranking, uh, Army officer overthrows Atete in Mali because uh, he can't handle the Islamic uh, insurrection in the north, only to have the Islamic insurrection completely take over the north. Uh, and again, too, I mean, a lot of these Tuareg groups were loosely aligned with, uh, you know, groups like the, um, the, the uh, Masana Liberation Front, uh, only to eventually kind of be pushed out uh, of, uh, you know, dominance and basically the entire north kind of fell to um, the, these, you know, very extremist, Salafist, jihadi groups. And this opened the door, as I said, for France to set foot again in a much more overt military role. Now, France has always sort of done this. Um, and it, again, they they control much of the uh, uh, w- former West African colonies through the use of the, um, the uh, currency, which is ultimately controlled by France. And in a less sort of overt, in-your-face way, uh, France controls y- the UN peacekeeping. So that's that, that's sort of the the, uh, the little, uh, I don't know, the, the, the table scraps that are, are thrown to France as a member of the Security Council and as a player in the sort of larger geopolitical game, uh, while the U.S. obviously really controls the UN and can kind of dictate everything, um, you know, and, and uh, the, the UK traditionally has been more in charge on the financial side of the, the UN. France controls the peacekeepers. Now, that is through, obviously, French proxies, uh, you know, that are officials at the UN. But France has long used the UN as cover in order to uh, reassert dominance or to control various areas. And if you look at much of the peacekeeping missions uh, that the UN employs, you will see that there there is a, uh, 
uh, there does uh, appear to be a correlation between where UN peacekeepers are and where France has uh, political and economic interests, uh, particularly, as I said, in West Africa, places like Mali, Niger, Chad. It's a whole slew of countries uh, that uh, have uh, large UN peacekeeping operations um, that, uh, you know, the more you look at it, uh, they, they seem to be, you know, protecting a various French economic interests. Now, again, what does this have to do? Why why are we, we concerned with Burkina Faso uh, in particular in all of this? Well, as I said, it did allow for France to kind of step in, to reassert control and dominance of this area. But in a much larger sense, this also opened the door for the U.S. to uh, ex- expand AFRICOM uh, in West Africa. When you had Mali fall, you had this proliferation of various jihadi groups. You saw an uptick, uh, not only in violence, uh, you know, targets being, uh, you know, uh, buildings being blown up, uh, churches, mosques, things like that, indiscriminate shooting. Uh, you also saw a proliferation of weapons. Uh, so again, when Libya fell, you had a lot of uh, guns and arms flowing out of Libya throughout West Africa. You also, uh, you know, on the opposite end, you know, across the ocean, a flow of drugs as well, mainly cocaine going up through West Africa, out through North Africa into Europe. So you saw all that, that kind of going on. And it, it again, it opened the door for AFRICOM to uh, set foot, to uh, assert its dominance. And it was also just a wonderful excuse. Well, I mean, we, we you know, we, we can't let uh, a group loosely affiliated with uh, Al Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb, we can't let them uh, take over because uh, soon they'll they'll be attacking America, you know, from their their bases in northern Mali, which is very isolated. It's a lot of desert. Um, you know, you're, you're not going to be able to launch a a serious operation. But again, that's the justification. And as I said too before, it's important to note there's no no group has claimed responsibility for this kidnapping. So it, there 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 could be no connection. This just could be a group of people, uh, a low level gang that just knows that uh, they could make money by handing off hostages to a more established political group uh, like Ansar Din, uh, or militant political group, who you know could then ransom them off or, or what have you in order to fund uh, jihad or, or basically just to fill their own pockets. So, you know, that also, again, that door is opened by the mere fact that these groups are allowed to flourish. All because, uh, not all because, but in a lot of ways because in 2012, the government of Mali was was overthrown only to see the proliferation of all these groups. Now, that brings us to this past Sunday, when uh, a Catholic church was attacked in Burkina Faso. Now, this is, uh, and, and, well, just to fill in some of the specifics of that, uh, this was last Sunday, the 12th of May, Mother's Day, uh, a Catholic church was attacked by gunmen, uh, left six dead, including a priest. The church was set on fire, as well as uh, several shops in the area. Two cars were set on fire. I saw some reports uh, that the the group uh, was looting pharmacies in the area for supplies, obviously, uh, and then they you know they just kind of fade away. Now again, there's no uh, there was no immediate claim of responsibility, and it's interesting when you you look at some of the articles uh, writing about this, you know whether it's France 24 with their agenda uh, or BBC or, or the New York Times, what have you. Reuters, uh, they they're very quick to say, well, we don't really know who did it, but we know that you know the, the whole area is a lawless center for radical jihadis, and they're operating everywhere. And and of course, you know, the, they're, they're targeting a Catholic church, so the, the immediate uh, you know response is, uh, oh, you know, they, they, it must be Al Qaeda, right? That that's that's the the image that they want to present. And again, I, I don't think we should necessarily dismiss that. Obviously. A Catholic church is uh, – you're, you're making a statement 
whether you want to or not, whether you are a, a political or religious extremist group, you are making a statement by attacking a Catholic church, especially also killing a priest, you know, that, that, uh, even, uh, people that, uh, hate the, the Catholic church and whatnot. I mean, there is this sort of, uh, it, it, it's like, Chuck and I were talking about with the uh, burning of Notre Dame. It, it's just it's like a symbol, you know. It, it, you shouldn't attack a religious institution like that, you know. Let alone a you know a man of God, a man of man of the cloth, uh, like a priest. So it it it, it gets it gets people. Uh, it you know it agitates them. Uh, it gets them angry and and uh, nervous and anxious and all the you know all these wonderful emotions. Um, that uh, politicians love to exploit in order to push economic agendas, political agendas, and whatnot. And we should also note that this is the second attack on a church in Burkina Faso in two weeks, and I believe the third or fourth attack in five weeks. So there is, there has been uh, something of a trend Um uh, you know, with, with attacking Catholic churches. I should know too that I believe it's maybe roughly, uh, 25 or 30% of Burkina Faso is Christian. So it's not, uh, you know, it's, it's not like a, it's a minority, obviously, but it's, it's a, it's a fairly well established minority. Um, so that's, that's interesting in and of itself as well. Uh, now, where was this particular town? This was the town of Dablo which is 124 miles north from the capital of Burkina Faso, which I'm going to completely uh, destroy the pronunciation of this. Uh, please, if there's any listeners out there from Burkina Faso or anyone uh, that can pronounce this properly, please do let me know. But I believe the capital is Ouagadougou. I know that's probably wrong. But anyway, Dalbo is about 124 miles north from uh, Ouagadougou. Now, why is uh, this uh, Dablo, this, this small little town, important? And again, I, I stress small. It's really difficult to find this on a map. If you, um, you know, if you go to Google Earth, it doesn't show up. Uh, I had to go through like three or four different uh, maps that I found online of Burkina Faso to actually figure out exactly where uh, Dablo was. Now, why is that important? Well. Dablo is also, uh, it, it, as I said, it, it's located in the north of the country. Uh, and what is also located in the north of the country? Uh, well, massive deposits of the number one export of Burkina Faso and basically the entire economy of Burkina Faso, and that is gold. Dablo is um, up in the north where, as I said, there are huge swaths of gold reserves. Uh, there, um, it's, it's actually something called the, uh, Bur- uh, I think it's Barimium, which is a, it's like a, a rock structure, I guess, that, that spans all across um, that general area of West Africa. I think it's through Burkina Faso, down into uh, Ghana, I believe Togo, Benin as well. Um, it is it has this the uh, Barimium rock deposit or whatever, um, and I think that it actually comes from like the there's a river, the Burman River or something like that, which is I guess the ultimate source. But anyway, in these uh, you know large rock structures are significant deposits of gold, and this is what basically Burkina Faso's entire economy is. Um, I think it's nearly 50% of their economy is gold and the other 50% 50% or so or 30% is cotton exports. The cotton exports have tremendously fallen because of uh, there's been a lot of drought in Burkina Faso. There's not a lot of arable land, there's not a lot of water. Uh every time there's a drought, uh I mean, you know, you're not going to be able to grow cotton which uh, does require, you know, a, tr- a tremendous amount of water. Uh, but uh, they're, you know, gold, uh, which also actually does uh, require a tremendous amount of water as well. Um, but, you know, the, the gold isn't going to go away because there's a drought. So there's a lot of gold all over Burkina Faso. And it's interesting to me that, that Dablo is located in the north around these huge deposits, including not that far. I think it's, um you know, it's uh, maybe like a, a hundred 
maybe maybe a hundred miles, maybe ninety miles or so um, from uh, the Tarpaco mine, which is a huge uh, gold mine. Uh, it's run by Norgold, uh, which owns a few other. Uh, it owns a much larger mine, uh, basically to the the west of that, the um, Bissa mine. But uh, it's sort of sandwiched in between those two, and this kind of got me to thinking. Um, you know, is there, is there, what's the, what's the larger sort of context for all of this? Um, and then, uh, you know, I started looking at the majority of attacks in, uh, Burkina Faso because, you know, uh, around like 2010, there were really nothing. You know, there was, uh, Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb obviously existed, but, you know, there were pockets of them in Niger, in Mali, uh, and there weren't really any significant attacks in Burkina Faso. Now, if you look at, I'm, and, and again, I'm, I'm going um, by uh, a study that was conducted uh, February of this year by the African Center for Strategic Studies. So again, you know, take it with a grain of salt. It's, um, you know, it's a big think tank funded by, uh, you know, many of the usual suspects that fund big think tanks. But uh, they have an interesting interactive map where you can look at, uh, you know, our locations where there's armed conflicts, different um, groups that are involved. And if you jump to, um, you know, if you go from like 2016, for instance, there's a few here and there in the north in Burkina Faso, which shouldn't be all that surprising because there's a lot in the south of Mali in that same general area. But if you go to 2018, there are huge concentrations of uh, attacks and, and groups operating in Burkina Faso, uh, mainly in these huge regions where there are large gold deposits. Now, there are large gold deposits in the south of Mali, near the border with um, Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, and interestingly, there, are, there aren't there are a lot of, uh, there are really no attacks that I know of in that general area. But in the, the extreme north, you have a lot of these groups operating. Uh, so, you know, th- this kind of begs all sorts of interesting questions. Um, y- is there a connection between this? Uh, I mean, there, undoubtedly there, there has to be some kind of a connection. Uh, you know, there, there's no, um, there's, there's no, uh, I don't know. It's, it's not just a coincidence. Um, but, you know, as I said, I think that that illustrates a much larger issue here. Why are these groups operating in these areas? What do the gold companies um, have to say about this because believe me, Burkina Faso is, is, it's, it's increased its, uh, gold production over the years. Uh, you know, that's, it's, as I said, I mean, that's like the one thing that Burkina Faso really has to export, which again is this stupid metal, um, which really, you know, I, I'm sure I'm going to be upsetting some people out there. Um, but, uh, you know, I, and I used to be an avowed gold bug in the past freely admit it. Um, I no longer am. Um, I think that this uh, fascination or this obsession with gold is uh, extremely misguided and many times is just absolutely insane. Um, there's, you know, we could get into, maybe that's a, a topic for uh, a future episode, but I mean, just the occult uh, obsession with gold um, as, the, you know, the, the worshipping of gold, worshipping, you know, golden idols and things like that. So there's a lot you could unpack with that, but um, but essentially, I mean, it, it, it's it's not really helping anyone in Burkina Faso. Most of the gold mines uh, that operate in Burkina Faso are privately owned gold mines, and the government of Burkina Faso obviously gets a cut, but it's not even that big of a cut. So uh, it's a small percentage that actually goes back into Burkina Faso, and of course, that never trickles down. To average people, this is held in the hands of very politically connected uh, politicians in Burkina Faso, as well as businessmen and you know, uh, I'm sure security companies and things like that. But um, uh, beyond that, you know, it, it, it really is essentially this metal that pr- provides no. It, there's no sustenance. Um, there's nothing that uh, it really, you know, it, it doesn't help people in any real tangible way, at least people in Burkina Faso. Burkina Faso is also, uh, unfortunately very notorious for implying, uh, employing, uh, that's not even really the right word, but, uh, using forced labor 
in uh, gold mines. And, um, the, you know, in the past couple of years, there's been a real uptick in the amount of uh, children uh, that are basically working as slaves in these gold mines. And you also have to kind of wonder, too, the connection between these jihadi groups. Um, there's a lot of attacks in these general areas. The gold mines are never targeted, interestingly. Uh, and you, you, you know, and you have to assume too that if you're a huge company, you're a multinational mining conglomerate, uh, or even a, a fairly small one, you're operating in Burkina Faso, you're going to have security. That's just a given. Uh, but I mean, you know, how much are you really spending on security? How secure are these facilities? Uh, that no one, no jihadis ever attack these, these, uh, uh, institutions. And you'd think that some level too. I mean, there, there's going to be foreigners there, right? There's going to be white guys uh, that are overseeing uh, the, these gold mines. They would make excellent hostages, and, and particularly too, um, you know, a big corporate gold company. I mean, they, they can afford to pay a ransom, and and they don't really have much to lose. You know, it, it's not um, they can negotiate with terrorists, right? That's fine. <laughs> uh, you know, it, 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 they're not uh, you know the United States or something like that. Uh, so they can kind of do that. And if you look historically at um, other kind of uh, geopolitical hotspots where there are some sort of a natural resource, you also see that there's a lot of, uh, shall we say, cooperation between large multinational companies and uh, the various armed groups that operate. So if we look um, in Nigeria, um, in the uh, uh, Niger Delta, where there's a ton of oil, uh, you've got Chevron down there. You've got Exxon Mobil. You've got this uh, entire what was once a, a, a very underdeveloped. I mean, it still is underdeveloped, but an underdeveloped, um, you know, jungle environment. I guess you, you could say uh, it's a lot of marshland. Uh, there's not a lot of roads. Uh, but now, you know, and you've got a people that are extremely poor that have uh, in Nigeria. You know, they've long been ignored by. Uh, those, you know, in power, certainly those in the north of the country where the, you know, the more, the, you know, more, more, uh, I don't know, uh, larger economic development, things like that. Uh, you, now you've got this entire area, uh, that has uh, just been completely decimated by the oil companies. I mean, there, there's oil spills continuously. Most of the water has been poisoned. Um, the fumes from the oil are everywhere. And what did you see? Well, you saw this proliferation of armed groups that started operating. Um, yet, um, you know, uh, for a while they would uh, kind of go after or, 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 you know, they would target various oil. But you don't see these oil companies really being hit. You don't see Chevron um, you know, having their facilities uh, bombed or something like that. If you look at Colombia, this uh, there was a huge scandal not that long ago um, where uh, I believe it, it was a, a series of um, emails, I think, from uh, internally from Chiquita, which, of course, is um, the, uh, you know, uh, uh, students of uh, CIA history will know that Chiquita is um, the, uh, what is it, United Fruit. Uh, that's just a rebranding of that wonderful banana company that uh, overthrew the democratically elected government in Guatemala. Uh, or, who, or you know, they, they asked the CIA to overthrow the democratically elected government in Guatemala uh, so that, uh, you know, they could uh, continue to exploit uh, the Guatemalan people. Um, and sell bananas. That Chiquita is the same company. They just rebranded themselves and, you know, try to, uh, you know, just, just sort of uh, wipe away that image. Even they know their image is bad publicly. Uh, you don't actually have to be a student of um, the CIA's uh, history in the 1950s to know uh, about the United Fruit Company. Well, it came out not that long ago that uh, Chiquita was paying off all sorts of uh uh, far left and right groups that were operating in Colombia. So they were paying off the FARC, uh, ELN. They were paying off, uh, the, the sort of, uh, the, the paramilitarios, uh, these right wing guerrillas. That was all happening. Um, there was, there was some sort of a tacit agreement, 
uh, between, um, you know, uh, Chiquita and other companies that were operating in that area, uh, where, whereby they, they looked the other way when these groups were, uh, moving cocaine and heroin around, uh, in the jungle. And I believe, I, I, I have to double check this because, um, um, I can't remember. It was a while ago when I read about this, but I, I think that there was even, there was something, uh, in these, these emails and these, like, leaked documents that, there were various, um, you know, banana companies in huge, huge multi-billion dollar con- conglomerates. They're still operating in uh, Latin America, uh, South, uh, Central America as well. That they were like paying off different groups, um, you know, in order to like go after, uh, like basically like, listen, we'll pay you and you can do whatever you want to that other banana company. You know, we're not going to, we're not going to tattle on you. Um, but just don't attack us. Uh, and you, you see the same thing happening in, um, uh, in Congo, in the DRC, uh, particularly, uh, you know, where, we're in the, the large diamond mines, um, you know, up, uh, like, um, in, uh, uh, like Goma, in the, the Kivu Mountain area, um, you know, where, where there's huge, uh, deposits of diamonds, but also, of course, uh, you know, coltan, zinc, uh, What's the, the one, um, I, I can't remember what it is. It's basically like in all electronics, uh, you know, and, and, uh, it's all found in, uh, the DRC. You see a lot of these huge companies that are mining there and they're, they're paying off all sorts of armed groups, partly for protection, but also, uh, you know, to ensure that the other guys, um, aren't going to be able to mine as much. So again, uh, this got me to thinking about what's happening in Burkina Faso right now, vis-a-vis gold, jihadi groups, uh, the proliferation of these groups. If you look again, if you go to the um, the uh, African Center for Strategic Studies and you look at the map, I mean, the, the amount of these groups that are operating all up in the north where there's huge deposits, and yet gold continues – uh, to uh, be, uh, you know, coming out of Burkina Faso. Is there an incentive here? Uh, you know, it's very interesting. Also, too, uh, we could even, you know, we can kind of go a, a little bit deeper, too, and uh, look at the idea that uh, one of the last things that uh, places like France and, and certainly the U.S., but in particular France, want is they never want gold to stay in Africa. That's very important to to, uh, to keep in mind. You know, the gold that's being exported out of Burkina Faso, they don't want any of that gold to be actually in the country. And if you think about it, you know, it's, it's one of these sad realities. A country that is literally, you know, the, the, the streets could be paved with gold, right? I mean, they're sitting on a giant deposit of this stupid metal that everybody wants to have a piece of, right? Yet they, they're never going to use it. Um, France is very afraid of any of the, the West African countries ever uh, getting together and creating a gold-backed currency. Now, again, I'm not advocating one way or the other. Um, you know, I think that the whole gold standard thing is very, extremely problematic. But uh, that is why um, Laurent Gbagbo was overthrown in Cote d'Ivoire, just just to the south of Burkina Faso, for hinting at the idea of, uh, you know, wanting to implement a gold-backed currency, uh, very much along the same lines as... Uh, Muammar Gaddafi, who uh, wanted to do that. And again, what was, what's the first thing that happens when we invade a country? We always go for their gold. Uh, that, could, that was in Libya. That was in Iraq. That goes all the way back uh, to when the U.S. Uh, first invaded Haiti in the uh, what are, uh, early 1900s. Um, you know, where was the first place that the military went? Into the bank to get all of the gold, to get it out of that country. Uh, because that's the last thing that they want the, these countries to ever do is to uh, actually become independent, to use their own natural resources to benefit the country uh, and not um, multinational gold corporations. But anyway, I'm kind of digressing and I'm going even in a different direction than I thought originally uh, when I wanted to uh, 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 talk about Burkina Faso. Um, so along with these huge gold deposits, uh, we've also got um, – you know, and I, I think that what I mean to say is that I think that's part of this whole equation. 
Um, and that's why we should be focusing more on Burkina Faso. You've got a lot of violence going on. You've got a lot of uh, nefarious, very, um, you know, opaque groups operating. Some of them are Salafist jihadi groups. Some of them are nationalist groups. Some of them are just simply criminal syndicates that are operating. But you've got them moving and uh, carrying out operations in an area filled with very important natural resources to the rest of the world that are going untouched. It, you know, what, what's, what's the, the story behind that story? On top of that, you can also add in this, uh, clash of civilization sort of, a, a flavor to it where it's, they're attacking Christians, right? And that has become much more uh, front and center in the news lately. We had uh, the, uh, the the brutal uh, Easter bombings in Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka's they just uh, there's a, a curfew, a national curfew in Sri Lanka right now because um, you've got uh, various uh, other ethnic religious groups going around attacking Muslims in Sri Lanka, uh, bombing mosques. So again, this this clash of civilization. Uh, talk. You, you see that more and more uh, from the, the right wingers here in America. You know, Christians are the most persecuted minority or majority in, or whatever in the entire world. Uh, there's a war against uh, Christians and Christmas and Jesus and, uh, you know, everything in between. You, every time, you know, I saw a lot of the, the usual uh, suspects on, uh, you know, alt right, uh, right wing Twitter sphere going on about Burkina Faso suddenly. Again, they wouldn't be able to find it on a map. They don't know anything else about Burkina Faso. And again, those are so many of those people that are, are oh God, you know, there's a war on on uh, on Christians and, and uh, look, Burkina Faso is just the, the latest. Those are all a lot of those same people are also the ones that are saying, oh, you should buy gold quickly. You know, uh, how much of that gold comes from Burkina Faso? Do they, they have any uh, issue with, uh, you know, Christian children uh, being sold into slavery uh, to work in extremely hazardous gold mines? Um, and some of those big gold pits with the, this poison water? Uh, no, I, I don't I don't see them uh, up in arms about that. But to a larger, uh, my larger point here, I think that there is there is become this sort of resurgence of the clash of civilizations, what, what um, Hunt, Samuel P. Huntington wrote about. I think that there's that really kind of taken on a, its second or third wind. More people seem to be obsessed with this idea. And I think that this is another way that the neoconservative movement has been able to once again – not even reinvent themselves, but to use an old trope and an old idea, and they've been able to re-inject it into society. We see that more and more, uh, this idea that it's us versus them. Uh, they're attacking Christians everywhere. Look, you know, and I think that Burkina Faso is just the latest in a series of events like this, uh, and that they are just simply using, they're using this country and what is going on there, and they are exploiting that. And I do wonder if, to sort of like um, look at something like the power of nightmares, the, the connection between jihadi groups and the neocons is so close. Is that still happening to this day? And again, looking at the larger issue too of the natural resources that are that are at play in Burkina Faso, uh, there, there's so much that I think is is kind of we're, we're missing. Uh, we're, we're not able to see the bigger picture when it comes to these sort of things. And I think we are really actually being tricked into buying into this propaganda again. You can already kind of see that with uh, all this talk about Iran, you know, and, and uh, uh, the, it's interesting uh, to get a little off topic. And I think I'm going to talk about this uh, later on uh, Chuck Ocelli's show on the Ocelli effect tonight. But uh, it's funny that uh, the only time uh, natural resources uh, get attacked, right, or, or sabotaged, or, or, or whatnot, is uh, like when it's it's when it's uh, I don't know. It's like one of our. It, it's only ever done by our real arch enemy. Uh, so it 
jihadis in Burkina Faso, they're not attacking gold mines owned by American companies. Uh, no, but you do see the government of Iran supposedly behind the tanker sabotage of uh, two Saudi oil tankers. Really kind of uh, – and we'll, I'll, I'll dissect that a bit later because there's, there's – I mean it's just – I think it's a, a lie. Uh, but anyway, um, that's when we see uh, the, the – I don't know, the, the sort of um, – what I think I'm, I'm talking about here, that's when we kind of see it, is when it's our ally being attacked by a foreign government. But it's never these these groups that are supposed to be so antithetical to our way of life. They're not uh, – they don't really care. Um, and again, too, if you were a jihadi group, uh, wouldn't you think that uh, a, a target like a Western-owned gold mine would be a, a prime target? I mean, what you know? That's a that's a statement, right? Um, especially too if they if they ran off with a whole bunch of gold, <laughs> um, but it doesn't happen. But anyway, I find it interesting that we have this um, this sort of uh, us versus them mentality seems to be injected into everything. You even look at the the stuff with Venezuela uh, when uh, you you had John Bolton talking about the Maduro and and his. Uh, government that they were godless people, you know, that they worshipped a, quote, false god. Now, he was, I think, kind of making a reference to socialism. But it doesn't matter because that that plays to this sort of apocalyptic uh, Christian mentality. The same goes for Mike Pompeo, who, I mean, he believes in the rapture. I mean, that that is his ultimate, uh, you know, that that is to him, you know, his, his role in life, his role as a, um, the CIA director and now as uh, Secretary of State is to help you know fulfill the rapture. <laughs> you know that that is uh, that that's when the, his his job will fully be done. So there were there, you, that's being inserted into so much of what we're seeing. The same thing too with um, what's going on uh, in a place like Burkina Faso. It's horrible, uh, obviously that the churches are being bombed, that people are being killed, but. Don't lose sight of the fact that there's a lot more at play here. There's a lot more that is being missed when it comes to this. It's not just that a church is being attacked. Keep that in mind. It's that a church is being attacked in a region where you have a lot of outside influence that is looting the country um, and is uh, is pushing people to the brink of starvation in order to sell a bunch of a, a useless shiny rock which is only shiny when you polish it uh -huh. and that is sort of going uh, you know that's going unnoticed what is being noticed is this uh clash of civilization that we cannot survive uh with these you know the, the evil muslims uh here anymore we you know we've got to get rid of them but um anyway i i think i i've uh, i've kind of gone uh, in, in a slightly different direction than I, uh, I thought I would with this. But I just want uh, people to uh, really kind of take note of, of what's going on in Burkina Faso. Because there's, like I said, I think it explains a lot more. It's not just that there's violence going on. It's not just that it's violence uh, against uh, Christians being perpetrated by Islamic terrorists. It's that there's also tremendous natural resources at play. There are geopolitical machinations that may not uh, pop out at us immediately, having to do with France controlling these countries. And believe me, you're going to see France getting more involved now in Burkina Faso than they have a while. And I implore the listeners out there to do a little research, look about French you know, gold interests, um, where, you know, are there any French mines or French owned mines operating in Burkina Faso? Uh, is there, you know, is there something to that? And is this part of a cover? You know, is it easier for, uh, for the gold to get out of Burkina Faso when there are is, uh, Islamic jihadis everywhere? You know, Be, are the people of Burkina Faso, uh, less concerned with, uh, well, why is all of our gold being sold off, uh, to China or to the UK or to Americans or just simply to anywhere but us? Or are they more concerned with, well, I don't want to, um, you know, go to church and, uh, get shot? 
So, uh, you know, where, where do their priorities fall? But, um, anyway, I think, uh, uh, we will leave it, uh, there for this first hour. Uh, in the second hour, uh, after a short break, we will be speaking with Ken Silverstein of Washington Babylon. So please stay tuned. Straight out of the subway in New York City. Yeah, baby. The radio show that never sleeps. Now back to the man. Pierce Redman. Okay, everybody, welcome back to Porkins Policy Radio. I am your host, Pierce Redman. If you are joining us here in the second hour, we are, uh, I'm, I'm very excited to have on the line Ken Silverstein. Ken is, of course, the founder, editor in chief, and CEO of WashingtonBabylon.com, a website I highly encourage you to check out. Ken is also, of course, the founder of Counterpunch. Uh, he's also the author of several books, including Washington Babylon, which he co-authored with Alexander Coburn. And his most recent book is The Secret World of Oil. Ken Silverstein, how are you? I am great. How are you? I'm, I'm good. I'm glad to uh, finally have you on the show. Uh, it, it seems like it's a, you know, a little bit in the making. Um, and uh, of course, that was mostly me forgetting to email you back and whatnot. But um, it, Ken, why don't you, um, you know, for I, I mean, I assume all of my listeners are very familiar with you and your work, but we have lots of new people uh, joining the show all the time, listening for the very first time. So why don't you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Who is Ken Silverstein? Um, okay. Um, first off, thank you for highlighting WashingtonBabylon.com. I highly recommend it as well. Um, I'm the editor, founder in chief, and I call myself CSP, which is Chief Sleeves Purveyor. <laughs> it's a political website, and in our founding statement, my founding statement, I said, I'm going to treat politicians like uh, the National Enquirer treats Holly stars, Hollywood stars. So, you know, down and dirty and hard hitting. Mm-hmm. Um, because that's the way they should be covered. Actually, I sort of, there are things about the national Enquirer I like, it's easy to read. Yes. I mean, that's probably why uh, Donald Trump reads it. You know, you only need a short <laughs> attention span, but we have better content and it's, <laughs> it's political, but we have a new arts and entertainment section. We have all sorts of stuff going on. We have a lot of good writers, uh, working for us. Um, so the site is, we've had some problems with, uh, social media, uh, where, like I've been banned from Twitter a few times, mysteriously Facebook. Uh, none of my posts were visible from 2016 onward for like a month and a half. I sure it was just a coincidence. It was right after I returned from Venezuela and was reporting stuff that was highly controversial beyond that. So anyway, I just wanted to highlight that because that's, you know, I write for a lot of publications, but I'm trying to grow the website and I'm writing a few books. But I've written for everybody from Vice to I was a contributing editor to Vice. I still may be. I'm not actually sure. Um, <laughs> I haven't written for him a while. After Murdoch money went in, it um, got a little trickier there. But I write for The Nation, The New Republic. Um, I was the Washington editor of Harper's Magazine. I was on the D.C. investigative unit of the L.A. Times for five years. I've written for dozens and dozens of dozens of publications, almost always uh magazines. I tend to get fired or quit when I have office jobs, so I no longer am willing to go that route. So I work at home and on the street and going out to meet people for interviews. So um, uh, if you want to know anything more, feel free to ask. Yeah, no. Uh, and, and just uh, again, just wanted to, to reiterate 
uh, Washington Babylon is a tremendously good website. Uh, and I think that my listeners would, would, you know, really kind of appreciate it. It does, it, it, it takes, uh, you know, a look at politics that it is, I think, uh, lacking, you know, the, the sort of, um, like you, you don't, like, for instance, like, I mean, you just, you don't kind of sugarcoat it, you know, I mean, it, it even when, uh, I don't know, some newspaper or something is, is supposed, supposedly being adversarial, they are yeah. essentially being nice to whoever they're talking about. Uh, there's also just a, a really wonderful collection of contributors. Um, you know, I saw that uh, uh, Dan Kovalik, um, who we, we've had on the show before, uh, you know, just uh, had an article up. Uh, and also uh, the great uh, Sydney Leathers. Um, so I it's love a very, Sydney. Yeah, she's great. And um, her, her stuff on uh, Roger Stone is just, uh, it's funny, it's well-written, it's, uh, it's true. <laughs> uh, so it's just a very eclectic group. Uh, so it's some, some really fun stuff. Yes, uh, Sydney is has been with Washington Babylon from the beginning. She's our senior Washington correspondent, and it's no joke. You know, people tend to uh, think of Sydney. If I assume most of your listeners are familiar with her, I always refer to her as the woman who brought down Wiener. That being Anthony Wiener, who was mm-hmm. you know sending her dick pics and <laughs> um, got himself into a little bit of trouble, um, and has continued to get himself into a little bit of trouble over similar issues. And Sydney did not seek fame, BuzzFeed, which is just a reprehensible publication in my view, outed her. And then she, you know, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm not claiming Sydney is a saint. None of us are, okay? But Sydney is a brilliant writer. She's a brilliant woman. But because of her background, people tend to think, oh, you know, I mean, I hope Sydney won't kill me for saying this. I doubt it because we always we talk all the time, you know big boobs and mm-hmm. she's in the porn industry and therefore she's stupid. Well, you know what? I want to see somebody go up and debate her one-on-one because on the issues that she knows about, Hey, look, I, I, you know, I've been doing journalism for 30 years, but you know, like if you ask me to talk about, uh, either Treya, okay, I'm going to get schooled by anybody who <laughs> knows anything about it, but you put and Sydney knows a lot about a lot of things. And she is just a brilliant woman. So we have, yeah, that's the sort of people we, we, I like to think of us as outcasts, people who can't really write anywhere else for the most part. And I like to give those people a voice because I'm not saying we're right all the time. And when, when we're wrong and we discover we're wrong, we openly and honestly apologize. That doesn't happen a lot though. We're real careful. I've never been sued and I've been doing this for 35 years. So, um, I, you know, I, it's, it's, we try to be funny. It's political satire. It mm. mocks the elites, but, yes. but it's not satire. It's true. It's factual. We just try to make it funny and go after, uh, all the right targets. Yeah. And both you, parties. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, uh, you, you, I mean, you, you said too, like you, you kind of compare it to, um, what is, uh, like confidential, uh, which was an old, yeah. uh, magazine in Hollywood. Um, which, uh, you know, it has a very similar feel. Uh, I think Washington Babylon is a little bit better maybe than Confidential. Um, well, they got really right wing. You know, it's funny. Yes, they did. The, yeah, I mean, the founder, I think his name was Howard Rushmore, because we have a guy who writes using that pen name. Um, uh, and he was a left winger, and then he sold out and became a total traitor and fanatic anti-communist. He ended up com- uh, committing suicide. Um, but Confidential had a somewhat i mean it's a it was a terrific publication everybody should check it out on google because the covers are just gorgeous and that's aesthetically we steal from confidential all the time Mm. um but um it's a you know we're a more serious publication what they would do and we don't do this you know they would go and you know pay people for news so you know you know i mean which actually is pretty amusing and um but they started publishing garbage. And, you know, the thing is, like, I used to really like Gawker, and I wrote for Gawker once. But I got to say, and some of you may disagree, and some of your listeners may di- disagree, I don't like Peter Thiel at all. He's a contemptible human being. But, and he, you know, he was the vehicle that, that brought Gawker down, and he's an oligarch. He's a billionaire. This is not a defense of Peter Thiel, but what Gawker did, uh, in publishing those photos, well, I'm forgetting the guy's name, uh, the wrestler. Um, Hulk Hogan. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you know, 
some of your listeners may go, well, big deal. But the thing is, you know, people are entitled to a, a right to privacy. Newt Gingrich wasn't when he was moralizing about family values, but he was out banging his interns. <laughs> I mean, no, you lose your right to privacy. But Hulk Hogan never was going around preaching morality. But even worse, and, and I, you know, embarrassed to say myself that I used to laugh at some of Gawker's stuff, you know, like some drunk woman, you know, in some small town would be going through a Wendy's or a McDonald's and, you know, she was trashed and made a scene. And it's like, you know what? That's not really a good target. I mean, <laughs> yeah. if it was George Soros or Peter Thiel who was drunk at a McDonald's, then I'd say <laughs> do it. But, you know, that's not fair. We don't go after, you know, ordinary, and for lack of a better term, because nobody's ordinary. Everybody's pretty extraordinary is what I discover when you actually talk to people. But, you know, go after the right targets. And so I think that Gawker deserved to die. And we wrote about it, actually. I'm glad it's gone. It was a reckless, irresponsible publication. They did really funny stuff. They had some great writers, but they committed an atrocious act and many atrocious acts. And weirdly, this evil Republican oligarch brought them down, but they deserved it. You know, not every writer there, but the publication was shit. No, no, I, I, I know what you mean. I, I used to be a huge fan of Gawker, but uh, I think they, they also, in like a way, the, the, they by pushing the envelope so far in terms of what uh, they consider journalism there, I think is actually a negative. Like, like mm-hmm. a video of Hulk Hogan, it isn't really news. Who cares? Um, it's not news at all. It's not. A, yeah. It's not in the public interest. That's what we're supposed to be. Right. We are supposed to be serving the public interest. I mean, wh- what interest is served by that? It's just Gawker looking to get clicks and money. So, yeah. good riddance. Yeah. Um, wait, just uh, quickly, Ken, while we're, we're sort of on the, the, the media angle of this, and uh, I was also uh, – uh, Chuck was uh, just sent me a message. Uh, he wanted to know, and I do t- as well. I mean, uh, what do you think of uh, the Intercept lately? Uh, and it's it sort of, uh, I mean, it seems like everybody that's ever gone to the Intercept with uh, classified information has uh, been sort of thrown under the bus or outed. And you very briefly uh, worked at the Intercept, and you've a uh, tremendous uh, insight into the Intercept. You've written about how horrible it was, obviously, um, and. Uh, you know, and much of that in, in with the um, what's his name, Adnan Saeed, and your your articles about him. Uh, and I mm-hmm. uh, am uh, 100% agree with you. I think he did uh, course, commit murder. Of he did. It. Yeah. Either I mean, he may have had an accomplice, but he was involved. He did it. Yeah. I mean, the state is not always wrong. I mean, mm. you know, the, you often is, and and the prosecution may have used unethical tactics, but he was guilty, and so I'm glad he's in prison. But yeah. the intercept. You know, it was like Jeremy Scahill, who is, you know, just like a pathetic journalist. I know that lots of people like him, but I worked with Jeremy. He's a joke. I mean, he, his view was, oh, wow, you know, you're pr- protecting the man. Like, mm. no, it's like, Jeremy, sometimes the state does put bad people away. I'm really sorry, but, <laughs> yes. you know, he's a killer. I mean, think, you know, Heyman Lee, that young woman who died. I mean, in that case, you know. She died, and all evidence points to Adnan Saeed. So I'm really sorry. I don't care that he's a person of color. He killed this young girl. Her family suffered a tremendous loss. I sent 500 bucks at the time I had money because Omidyar paid me well. Pierre Omidyar, the sleazebag owner of The Intercept, was paying me well. So I sent $500 to a fund established in her name because I was really moved by the story and outraged that serial that Sarah Koenig would lionize this guy who was clearly guilty of murder. Mm. I mean, it's disgusting. And the intercept you ask, I mean, we can talk, keep this short. I mean, I wrote, when I quit the intercept, I asked to be fired so I could get on, uh, on uh, unemployment. Cause I was suffer. You know, I probably gave up, not probably. I gave up over a million dollars in the last four years from quitting The Intercept because I had a very high salary and they were offering to make me head of their Washington. Uh, I was going to run the Washington Bureau and I quit in disgust. Um, and I, you know, I don't really want to talk about that because you're if anybody's listening, listening, I wrote about it for Politico. Yeah, we'll um, link up to yeah. that as well. Yeah, thank you. So, you, you know, people can find that. But when I wrote that piece, I thought the intercept was nearly incompetent. Now I think it's something much more nefarious. 
I believe in your listeners may think I'm crazy, and I'm not saying I have all the evidence, but people keep presenting me with more evidence. I think it was an intelligence operation. You know, and I know I hate to even say this because, you know, when you start talking conspiracies like this, but everybody knows there's something wrong there. They've sent three whistleblowers to prison. No media organization has that track record. And their whole mission was to protect whistleblowers. And, and Snowden, meanwhile, is in Moscow for the rest of his sad life. And Glenn Greenwald is rich and famous and lives in Brazil and, you know, was getting paid a million dollars a year four years ago, half of it in salary and half of it hidden in a bonus that he received through a Florida LLC that he hit up, that he set up to hide his money. Um, <laughs> but I thought it was just an incompetent startup. I had no idea. It's only after time and people kept coming to me. I didn't, I don't even, you know, the weird thing is I don't really give a shit about the intercept anymore. It's just that people keep bringing me information. But then recently, you know, I started noticing things that are quite curious. I mean, Jeremy Scahill put the most recent whistleblower in prison, and that was around 2013, right around the time The Intercept was being set up. Um, it just came out now, but it dates to the time that The Intercept was set up. Uh, uh, Matthew Cole came to The Intercept from ABC News after he put John Kiriako in jail. I mean, by recklessly exposing him. Kiriako worked for the CIA. He's the only man who went to prison due to torture, except he didn't commit it. Mm. He exposed it. He was a whistleblower. And so he went to prison. And then there was Reality Winner, who, missed, who Scahill and Matthew Cole, after going to The Intercept, put into prison. You know, you could say it's all a coincidence. Um, maybe they're just incompetent. But why, was, why would The Intercept hire Matthew Cole after he put John Kiriako in prison? You know, it's just a weird thing. Why has no one been disciplined there? Why has no one been fired for putting whistleblowers in prison? If this is an organization dedicated to exposing wrongdoing, ind fearless independent reporting, they, they say, and if they are dedicated to protecting whistleblowers, you would think if you put a whistleblower in jail, you could lose your job. Well, Scahill's got two scalps, and so does Matthew Cole, one at ABC and one at The Intercept. I mean, why are these people still getting, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars a year or more? And the other thing that I find curious is that Pierre Omidyar, the Iranian-American owner, um, served, I mean, he, he has multiple ties to the Obama administration, to the Democratic establishment. He does the government's bidding in Ukraine, Venezuela, uh, India. Um, where I'm India. Yes. Yeah. Right. Thank you. <clears throat> um, and I believe, and also let me also say, if you think that my theory is wrong, read Tim Shorrock's series at Washington Babylon. He doesn't go quite as far as I go, but he has a devastating critique at Washington Babylon about the intercept. But I think, and I can't prove it, but if you read Tim's stuff and you read why my story saying why I think it was an intelligence op, and if you consider the evidence I've just presented, and there's way more, um, it's hard to conclude otherwise. I mean, I believe Pierre Omidyar, he's a tech oligarch, that someone in the intelligence community approached him and said, um, you know, set up, you've got a lot of money, maybe they provided funding, hire up a bunch of left-wing reporters um, and uh, pay them a lot of money make them your train pets. We didn't produce anything. For, and that's why I quit. <laughs> I quit because I couldn't write. I mean, I couldn't, I, I had finally started writing, but then I had constant feuds with editors there. Um, so I came, you know, I quit it. And like I said, at the time I thought, Oh, it's just an incompetent tech startup and I don't want to be bothered. But, um, the, uh, the thing is that, um, you know, Omidyar, I think he corralled a lot of left-wing journalists, paid them a lot of money. They barely produce anything. Every once in a while, they'll do a great story. And I actually like some of the people over there, not many at this point. But, um, but and then I think, you know, the, part, the other part of the intelligence op, the more important part was set up a drop box and tell, you know, and tell whistleblowers, yes. hey, this is the place to go. And, gee, three of them have ended up in prison. So how do you explain that? 
I mean, maybe they're just stupid and incompetent. And P- Piero Midiar is not a smart man. I met him. I mean, you can read about that in Politico. I mean, he gets his ass kissed because he's a billionaire and he thinks he's smart, but he presented at the intercept when I was there. And the man is, I mean, you know, I have a teenage son who is his mental, his <laughs> intellectual superior by a long shot. He, you know, eBay's a piece of shit company. Look, Apple, X, I hate Bill Gates, but Microsoft produces a useful product and Apple produces a useful product. I And Google, I mean, I may hate the owners, but they actually created brands and companies. eBay, you know, is that a prestige brand? No. Omidyar was in the right place at the right time. He is a dipshit. Um, he <laughs> has a hairstyle that you, you yeah, know, what like, is going on with that? What is going on there? The man is a complete moron. He mm. just was in the right place at the right time. I believe he's a tool of the U.S. government. Well, that's established because he does all this work with uh, National Endowment for Democracy. But I believe he's a more nefarious tool. So I would go a little further, but most of what I say is, you know, what I'm telling you is beyond the, the speculative part is, was he approached by U.S. intelligence, and did he then set up the intercept to fuck whistleblowers? I think that's what happened. Oh, and then you can even you can take it another step too, and just look at the basically sealing up all of these uh, documents from Snowden. The Snowden uh, thing, thanks. Exactly. I mean, mm-hmm. you you mentioned before too about this whole oh, it's a, there's a secure drop for whistleblowers. Uh, we only know of the three that got burned. I mean, who knows how many other people are have uh, submitted things to. The intercept that they're just that, sitting on, or they're gonna they're gonna send to the government, or you that's know. right. That's exactly right. That they're sitting on like the Snowden archives, which is locked and sealed. And Snowden, I mean, I think Snowden got played. I, I don't think he was a traitor. Um, which a traitor you define as? I mean, I don't define a whistleblower as a traitor, mm. but uh, so maybe I shouldn't use that word. But 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 I guess I would say that because I think he was played by the Russians um, and. That's how, you know, I mean, there are too many weird things about that story. I've written about that, too, at Washington Babylon. I did a three-part series where I speculated about that. Because this is the thing, and this is true of Glenn Greenwald, too. Um, Snowden, Snowden's story, the official story is false, okay? I mean, the movie by Oliver Stone, he, Oliver Stone acknowledges he made shit up. Right. But Snowden lies about certain things that is beyond dispute and when people lie about certain things it makes you wonder if they're lying about other things i think what happened is that he was genuinely outraged at u.s foreign policy um he probably got set up by a female a honeypot which happens a lot um the russians are masters at it um i'm speculating here of course but you know, a woman who told him you're the smartest guy in the room and offered a shoulder to cry on and slowly but quietly encouraged him to download those documents. And then somehow he ends up in Hong Kong and then somehow he ends up in Moscow. I mean, he's going to live the rest of his life there as long as the Russian government allows him. He is Vladimir Putin's pet. Now, I don't think that's what he intended. I think he got played. Um, whether Glenn had anything to do with that or not, I mean, I, I don't think he did. Um, I do think Glenn is an evil person and that he has done some very evil things. Um, right now he's a tool of Fox news. Um, you know, the only people, you know, who, who give him a venue really, um, because he, he's sort of lost his credibility, but, um, you know, um, Glenn is not a journalist. This is, this is just fa- this is you could call it an t- opinion, but it's it's factual. It doesn't prove anything of what I've previously said or that he's evil. But Glenn is by nature, by training, a lawyer. So if Glenn had a case where a pedophile were his client, Glenn would build a case as a lawyer is supposed to do, trying to get the pedophile off. Now, the problem is when you take that mindset to journalism, Glenn, that's his mindset. He doesn't do any research. I watched him. You know, that phrase, you know, I saw how the sausage was made. Mm. He doesn't do any work. I mean, Snowden had to beg him to take the NSA documents. And that's why I don't think 
Glenn was complicit because he's lazy and it was like, ah, oh, fuck it, it's too much work. <laughs> and so he, he almost lost the biggest scoop. That's in the award, Academy Award winning documentary, that pathetic joke of a movie. But um, the thing is, he took that mentality to journalism. And so he builds cases and he's skillful. I mean, I agree with 80% of what he says. The 20%, though, that's wrong is dishonestly wrong. You know, Mary McCarthy famously said of Lillian Hellman, who I actually sort of like, but so I'm not taking sides in that dispute, but she famously said everything Lillian uh, writes is a lie, including and and the. And that's true of Glenn, because he can't reach a conclusion honestly, because he's just building a case from his lawyer days. And then when he's wrong, when the jury convicts the pedophile, uh, and this, you, I think you see the metaphor here, Glenn will go to his grave, never acknowledging error. So <laughs> then he doubles down on positions that are false. And I've, I've seen it. I watched it up close. When I'm wrong, I apologize. I have issued, you know, flagrant corrections. I, that's the only check on journalists. That's why the profession is so dishonest. We are entitled to call lobbyists and politicians who have to, by the way, submit disclosure statements about their income, sources of income. I mean, I mean, our political system is a joke, but at least lobbyists and, and, and politicians are subject to some scrutiny. I mean, journalists demand it of the people they cover, and yet they're not willing to offer it of themselves. I've asked Glenn, how much money do you make? And I'm happy. I'll tell you. I mean, I'm not going to give you my tax returns, but I'll, I'll tell you what I made last year. It's not a very high figure. It wouldn't embarrass me. It would embarrass my parents. <laughs> but um, the thing is, you know, I said, Glenn, did you get, because I know we did, a $500,000 bonus paid through a Florida LLC? I mean, you go to their 990 statements, and there was a $500,000 payment to an offshore company. Well, Florida, it's basically offshore, because that's where people hide money, as well as, you know, Bermuda and Cayman Islands. Cayman Islands, yeah. Yeah, whatever. I mean, you know. So... Like, what was that fee for? Well, I know what it was for. It was a bonus for Glenn. But Glenn won't admit it. He won't acknowledge it. He And then he writes, the most outrageous thing is, he won't discuss it, but he will write about rich Americans with offshore accounts. He's a rich American living in Brazil in a mansion with an offshore account. I mean, what level of hypocrisy is that? What world is this man living in that he goes on the air attacking people for sins that he's committed? I mean, I wouldn't have the balls to do that. I really wouldn't. I mean, you know, I, I mean, I'm not a perfect human being. I have plenty of faults. And I assure you, you know, if, 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 if I was a bank robber, I would get on TV or radio or your show and I would attack everybody except bank robbers. But Glenn will, you know, <laughs> he'll, he'll attack rich Americans with offshore accounts when that's exactly who he is. He hides his money and he won't reveal his salary. I mean, give me a fucking break. Hmm. No, I, I think the, the when you actually tear it all down and you you realize that he's not a journalist, and he never really was. He was like an opinion no. uh, columnist yeah, at the Guardian. You know, I, I mean, a bloviator, yeah, yeah, ex at, at best. Um, but at he really best. is just a, a, a like you said, he's just a sleazy lawyer. And not that you know you. you Whatever everyone deserves a, a fair trial, but look, people should really look back at some of the uh, clients that Greenwald, uh, yes. you know, uh, defended. And I mean, it's it, he chose those clients. Let's just put it that way, you know. He um, chose those clients, and then he dresses it up in the First Amendment. Yes, I mean, exactly. Yeah, that's the other one too, right? It, everything with him is the First Amendment. It's not no, no, no. Come on, he, he's know, not a, a, like a what do you, you know? He's not like a public defender. That's right. And he's got some very interesting tars, ties to the far right. Very oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he defended a right. bunch of neo-Nazis. Exactly. And, you know, and he, I mean, he would defend Alex Jones and dress that up in the First Amendment, even though I'm sure he got paid well by the clients he defended because nobody else would take their cases. You know, there are some people who have morals. Yes. I mean, give me a break. Mm. Um, so... Um, well, I think that that's probably enough time that needs to be spent ever on the intercept in Glenn Greenwald. But um, I am I am glad that uh, you know we we got to it because it's uh, it's shocking to me that there are seemingly there are still people that are being hired by the intercept, you know, and and uh, they, they are still desperate. 
Yeah. Because, you know, Mar- the, Mar- the Marxist concept of the reserve army of the unemployed. Mm-hmm. You know, journalists are, we are the chimney sweeps of modern right. times. I mean, that's overstating the case because we all are now. We're in an era of global jungle capitalism. <laughs> and the media here doesn't see it because they're all well paid, the mainstream media. But, you know, most people in this country are suffering. Um, so, um, uh, well, and I think it, it's, well, no, I was going to say, Ken, it, it's hard if you are a young journalist. I, I mean, I think I would, myself, I would, if someone came along and was, you know, here's a uh, million dollars to write for whatever crappy publication, I think I, to be, if I'm being honest, I would probably, you know, think about it for a second. Absolutely. There's I no mean, it, it's hard it. to pass that up. I mean, and, and, uh, it's very hard. You gotta, you may have a family to support. Yes. You know, we're all, we're all, you know, we're all frightened of the future. I mean, if you're, if you're not, then you're one of the 1%. <clears throat> the thing, and that's what makes Glenn all the more disgusting. And this is what makes me Glenn think that Glenn is not an innocent victim of Pierre Omidyar, but that he's in on the scam and, and certainly has helped cover up. And he and Scahill, you know, who Scahill was put two people in jail now, um, prison, uh, uh, you know, will moralize still about what great work they do. But, um, you know, Glenn doesn't need the money. He gets paid an extraordinary sum of money and he lives in Brazil. You know, I lived in Brazil in 19, for four years, uh, dating back decades ago. I don't know what the cost of living there is now, but I know he's not paying U.S. rates for his mansion and his help for the house. Okay. Oh, yeah. Glenn doesn't need the money. Hence, want, you know, I think Glenn doesn't quit because, well, there are two possibilities. One is because he and Omidy are partners of a sort in a really nefarious enterprise. And the second possibility is that Glenn can never admit he's wrong. And if he quits, he'll have to admit that in some way he was wrong. You know, so he's stuck there. It's sort of like Snowden being stuck in Moscow because, well, Glenn has gotten rich and famous and Snowden shrivels up in the Moscow winter. Um, you know, so. Oh, he can never the leave user. the intercept now. Cause if he does, I mean, then that's just a, a repudiation of his entire career. Yeah. I think, uh, but Omidyar will probably pull a, a plug at some point because, um, you know, unless there's government money behind it, I just don't know. I mean, but you know, Omidyar has got to be embarrassed by the whole thing now. I mean, everybody's trashing the intercept. It's an embarrassment. I mean, right. his intention, he was never, he never gave a shit about the first amendment. That's what he would come to New York um, and tell us. And mm-hmm. I actually said at one of the meetings, uh, you know, I, ba- you know, I basically said, I'm paraphrasing, but I don't really, you know, care what you think about the first amendment. The less I know about you, the better. You know, <laughs> I don't, you know, a publisher's role, an honest publisher, and there are a few, um, is to provide the money and shut the fuck up and let your writers do good work and your editors edit them and let the, you know, produce news. And the less you intrude, the better. That doesn't happen very often, but Omidyar was out of control in, you know, integrating himself into the publication. Um, so he never believed in the First Amendment. Most, if not all, media oligarchs don't care about that. They want to make money and they want their name just the way, you know, our oligarchs, Soros, you know, whoever Peter you want to say, Peter Thiel, they like their names at the, you know, the University of Blank, you know, the, the Peter yes. Thiel uh, Center University for... Dining Room. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, and Omidyar wanted to be known as a, a, you know, as a First Amendment champion and a publisher. Well, he's full of shit. And Greenwald, if he had any dignity, would have quit a long time ago. And Scahill, well, Scahill, I will say, I do want to in no way suggest Jeremy Scahill would, would have been complicit in uh, putting whistleblowers in prison. He's too stupid to be. It's like this is like Trump is too reckless and unpredictable for the Russians to ever have put him on the payroll. I mean, that whole theory yeah. is so preposterous. I mean, Trump's policies are monstrous. I don't like the man. I do admire that he makes the elites crap in their pants, but I mean, that's funny to watch. 
but I can't stand his policies. I didn't vote for him. I just sat out the election because I wouldn't degrade myself by voting for one of those two losers, Hillary or Trump. But, um, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Where was I going with this? Uh, uh, we're, I mean, just talking about, uh, you know, uh, Scahill basically being too oh, stupid yeah, yeah. to. Yeah, well, Trump is too reckless and unpredictable to be a Russian asset. And Scahill's too stupid. I mean, Scahill is, I mean, next to him, Omidyar is an intellectual giant. Mm-hmm. Jeremy's a joke. I, I mean, I met him. I spent a lot of time around him. I mean, I will be writing more about him and Glenn and Pierre. Only because people sadly keep bringing me information about them. I really have no choice. I would rather, you know, I mean, I spent a week exposing them. Oh, everybody should also read stuff. Uh, Barrett Brown, who knew Glenn Mm -hmm. well and worked with him, has been trashing them. And he also has been, you know, he presents a lot of evidence. Look, again, I got to say, I'm speculating about the one part, that it was an intelligence op. But there are a lot of people I've talked to who say, you could well be right. That is not an outrageous theory. But at minimum, it's a reprehensible publication that spends God knows how much money to produce very little quality journalism and that has put three whistleblowers in prison. It should be shut down. Mm. It should be shut down. Reality winners should not be in prison, nor should the other two whistleblowers. Okay? If anybody should be in prison, it should be Jeremy Scahill, Matthew uh, Cole, and Pierre Omidyar, because they ultimately are responsible for putting three whistleblowers in prison. It's contemptible and disgusting. And the fact that they portray themselves, continue to portray themselves as heroic, independent journalists is a tragic joke. Mm. Well, I guess, uh, Ken, on that, that note of uh, just sort of garbage journalism, uh, what, what are some stories uh, that, uh, you know, we, we should be focusing on, um, and, and particularly some of the stuff uh, maybe at, at Washington Babylon? I know uh, there's some, you've done some interesting reporting on the NRA. Maybe we could uh, explore a little bit about that, because this is something that uh, I, was, uh, I was actually totally unaware of, uh, the, the, the scope of the financial scandal. Uh, bet- you know, with Wayne Lapierre and, you know, uh, with o- Oliver North is a, evidently being investigated for something here in New York. Uh, yeah, but, um, yeah. yeah, I know, right? Exactly. Oliver North, he's an upstanding citizen. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. But the, um, I'm actually kind of shocked the, 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 it's also, in, you know, it's interesting to kind of link them with the, the NRA stuff. I mean, uh, Wayne Lapierre will, uh, portray himself as this, you know, down to earth guy and, you know, it's all about uh, our gun rights and good old fashioned old school America. And it, it turns out that he was, you know, spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on uh, travel expenses to the Bahamas and private, sh- you know, cars right. and chauffeurs. And maybe you could talk a little bit about this. You had a, um, an interesting article you just posted uh, yesterday uh, on the NRA. Yeah. And uh, and maybe we could also get into this uh, intern that uh, had her yeah. rent being paid. Yeah. And let me, let me emphasize that there, I did break the news here, but the credit goes to the Wall Street Journal. Um, and, you know, there you have it. There are great journalists working at the intercept even. But if you, you know, you can't, I am a, like, we have a hack list. Uh, we didn't do it last year, but we'll do it again this year. You know, like in, in, so in 2017, the hack list included Vox, the New York times, mother Jones, Buzzfeed. I can't remember the others. Um, um, but the thing is that, um, uh, there are good journalists at a lot of those places that I just mentioned. Um, but they are terrible publications given the resources they have and and the work they do. I mean, all of those publications I mentioned, you know, were sock puppets for the Russiagate narrative, the bullshit story that's fallen apart, no matter how they CNN and MSNBC try to dress it up. I mean, Russiagate fell apart. I mean, Mm -hmm. there, there, there are, there are real serious charges about Trump, but they don't have to do with him colluding with, Russia um, over many, many, many years. Um, uh, there's a part of this story that I know that I don't want to talk about, but fundamentally the Russiagate narrative was a bullshit. Um, but, you know, there are great journalists at those publications. And there, so the Wall Street Journal, I actually don't know that the guy who wrote the piece or the woman who wrote the piece, but they get the credit. 
and I do it, I say it in the first sentence, because they expose the misspending. What I did was, well, I first made a joke. I said, did, he, did the head of the NRA have an intimate relationship <laughs> with a Russian spy and have his group pay her apartment rent? And the headline's misleading because we are a political satire site. You know, there was this woman, Maria Butina, who I think is wrongfully in prison, uh, or, or, yeah, sentenced for 18 months in prison. Uh, I don't think she was a Russian spy, actually, but the NRA had, she had ties to the NRA. Um, <clears throat> so I raised that just to get pe- people to click. But there is a woman, a right-wing conservative woman, who was working for the NRA um, and is apparently, I mean, LaPierre, the head of the group, he billed the ad, the group's ad agency $39,000 for one day of shopping at a Beverly Hills clothing boutique, 18300 for a car and driver in Europe. And, and this is all from the Wall Street Journal and had the agency cover $13,800 in rent for a summer intern. Well, what I reported and what, to my knowledge, nobody else had, and I took screenshots, thank God, the night before the intern's... Uh, 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 Facebook, uh, right? Uh, yeah, she she deleted Facebook. I didn't get screenshots of Facebook. It was too late, but I did have her uh, WordPress page, and I got some other documents um, <clears throat> and tweets that I screenshotted. But I don't want to name the woman because I feel bad for her. I did name her in this story. I mean, so, but I mean... I, that was the part of the story that was news. I mean, the woman, um, every, and people had been talking about her in NRA chat rooms. Um, and she started working at the NRA in May 2017. And this is from a tweet that somebody else put up. And there was a picture of her at a Trump property the year before. Um, um, and then on her Facebook page, what I found, and, and, and she took it, I screenshotted it the day before I published the story, or her WordPress account. She had all these pictures from the Conservative Political Action Committee in 2016, um, including one of Wayne Pierre, uh, LaPierre. Um, and then on her WordPress, she wrote, Megan, I won't say her last name, but your readers can get it on my site, is a 21-year-old from Berryville, Virginia. She's a senior at Radford University, blah, blah, blah. She's a member of a sorority, public relations student society of America. Um, and she interns for the gun lobby. Now this was in 2016. Um, she, and we know that the NRA rented her apartment for her. Now why she lives, she could have, she lives in Berryville, Virginia. Um, the NRA headquarters is in Fairfax, Virginia. So she could have commuted like most of us. So why did the NRA need to rent her an apartment? One mm. can only speculate that. So that's, that's the part of the story I broke was that, you know, the, and somebody had put her name on Twitter, but I, you know, screenshotted a bunch of stuff and uh, exposed. Okay. Because they could come up with a cover story oh, well, we had no choice and she wasn't really using the apartment. Whatever they're going to try to get weasel their way out of this. The fact is they rented an apartment for her. They had the ad agency rent the apartment for her and she was in commuting distance of the NRA headquarters. So I don't know why. I mean, hey, you know, that's a great job perk. Yeah, you get a $14,000 salary and, you know, you get health benefits. Uh, you know, you get the bronze plan and, and we pay for your apartment when you can commute home. I mean, I'm only speculating why they would have rented her an apartment. It's also like a $14,000 apartment. That's quite expensive. Yeah, it is quite expensive, quite expensive. So something is terribly, terribly wrong. Mm. Um, Yeah. I mean, she's a summer intern. Okay. (laughs) I know. I mean, it just conjures up uh, so many, uh, just, you know, uh, questionable, uh, images and, and thoughts, uh, when you look at, but, and I think too, more to the point as well, I mean, it's just the, the, the spending spree that LaPierre is, was going, that's gotta be the tip of the iceberg. It's um, gotta be the tip of the iceberg. And yeah. there I would actually point readers to the journal, Wall Street Journal and other publications that are chasing it because unfortunately we don't have the resources to pursue some stories we're working on some blockbusters um we're going to have some killer stories 
that I think you're going to want to have me back on, in my humble mm-hmm. opinion. Oh, yeah, um, I would love to. Well, well you'll, I'll, let you, I'll be sending you links uh, within <laughs> the next uh, month, let's say. Um, but we don't have the resources. So I, I do also, it would be remiss not to ask your listeners, a lot of people I know don't have funds, but you know, if you have five bucks to spare, go to our website. If you've got a million, we'll take that too. Um, <laughs> Um, but, but if nothing else, go to our website and subscribe to our newsletter. Um, because we, I think we're in an environment where because Facebook, Google, Twitter, and other social media platforms, um, uh, uh, discriminate against independent journalist sites on the right and the left. Actually, I do read, uh, conservative sites and some of them are quite smart. Um, uh, you, we're, I mean, for, for Washington Babylon, I'm, I can already see the day where we are not online. It's just not worth it. We'll be a newsletter that will go out daily. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it won't be a newsletter. We'll be a daily publication like the old newspapers. Um, uh, because we won't, you know, the Google algorithm, I, there was a period where I would search for my name in quotes, Washington Babylon in quotes, and the title of an article in quotes, and it would not appear on Google. Now, maybe again, I'm paranoid, but, you know, look, other publications have had similar problems. Counterpunch, Mint, uh, Mint Press, um, other p- publications have encountered problems with social media, with the tech oligarchy. Mm. So I foresee a day where we're headed to, yeah, podcast. We're going to get around them, um, but it'll become harder. We'll be a daily, we'll be like a daily newspaper. In uh, two years. That's my sad prediction. I hope I'm wrong. But anyway, we need people. If you can support us, please support us. If you can't, at least subscribe to our newsletter and you'll get great news. Oh, yeah, totally. I mean, there, there's it's, it's fantastic stories. I, I agree with you, though, with the, the, the algorithm stuff is I, I never thought that, uh, you know, I mean, even like when I was like in college or or even a few years ago, if I were to Google something, uh, just, I would, you know, I guess it was at the time, you know, based on where I was, you know, I, I live in New York and all these things, I would never get Washington Post articles, you know, as like the right. first hit. And now suddenly you can't, you cannot look something up in the world without it being a, you know, where, where democracy di- or whatever the hell their idiotic uh, slogan oh, yeah, is. Yeah. Democracy <laughs> dies in darkness. In darkness, yeah. It's, it's such yeah, a owned, owned shit. by Jeff Bezos, one of, like, yeah. to me, the most evil of all the current oligarchs. I mean, mm. just the absolute worst. And a terrifying person, an evil, amoral man. Like the guy, I forget from the, oh my God, I'm Tesla. Uh, uh, Elon oh, Musk. Elon Musk. Yeah, yeah, another yeah. I mean, scumbag. I mean, <laughs> Be- uh, yeah, but Bezos is way worse. But the two, the thing that unites them is that both of them talked about how they they had so much money. The only worthy thing they could think of investing in was space exploration. Oh it's yeah, like, right. what about exactly. poverty, you assholes? Yeah, I mean, so. Oh no, anyway, of course. Yeah, and, and, I think yeah. we're headed to a news. For Washington Babylon will be headed to a newsletter future, and 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 you'll it'll be hard. I mean, I just have to again encourage people any of your favorite publications, subscribe to the newsletter because you're not going to, if your listeners, Hank, you know, after this show is over two hours later, they forgot about the show. I hope they didn't. But if you don't sign up to the newsletter now, you may forget about it and you may never hear about us for five years because you're searching for stories that we may cover really, really well, but the algorithm will have us so far down. You'll never hear of us again. That's where we're heading. I mean, there's no question about it in my mind. Um, I, I get, I hope I'm wrong, but Anyway, we want newsletter subscribers, so that's my last pitch for that. No, absolutely, and again, uh, encourage people to uh, go to WashingtonBabylon.com to check that out. Definitely donate if you have a couple of bucks, uh, you know, because everything helps. Everything um, helps. Everything helps. You know how I'm subsidizing uh, myself? Uh, <laughs> just in this terribly minor way, but, like, I buy, uh, I, I, I buy and sell stuff. Mm. I, uh, yeah, I mean, I travel, I'll bring back some, you know, bring like 10 little purse, purses from Vietnam or something mm. and, and sell them for a profit. You know, I sure. mean, I, I'm a hustler because you got to be a hustler now because independent journalism, you can't make a living. If you can be a right wing or a 
a left wing, not a left wing, a liberal or a centrist. And you can have a great career in journalism. But if you really want, look, if I want to write about Donald Trump, you know what I do? I have to go desperately seek funding from a liberal or lefty. And there isn't a lot of real lefty money around, but from a liberal foundation. If I want to write about Hillary Clinton, I got to get funding from a conservative foundation. The stories I write are honest. I never write, I mean, to the best of my knowledge. And if I get something wrong, I'll, I'll acknowledge it. But you cannot make an honest living as a journalist anymore. It's what you say. It's very hard to as an independent journalist, mm. because you have to, you know, chose one party line or another, you know, like a guy like David Corn and mother Jones, he's a joke wrong about everything on Russia gate. Um, you know, he's a, he's like, you know, a guy who goes on MSNBC, he's like a performing seal, mm-hmm. you know, it's not honest journalism. He may be right half the time or 60% or 20%. I don't know. I don't read him. He's too goddamn boring, but you know, and then on the, on the right, you've got the same thing. You've got performing seals. That's what, you know, we're chimney sweeps and performing seals. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, well, and uh, and they're all they're all trained, uh, you know, in in you know, with all of the little triggers to get people angry and uh, pissed off and uh, or or you know excited and happy. I mean, that's like so much of the the, the Russia gay stuff. That's why it, it plays so well on both sides. Uh, the liberals uh, can use it to get everyone agitated and upset. Uh, well, at the same time, uh, you know, uh, don't worry. You know, Rachel Maddow is going to be telling us at any moment now. You know, the, the you know uh, Trump will be taken down and whatnot. And then the the, the right wingers, uh, you know, use it to the same thing. They use it to to uh, look how silly all the liberals are and blah blah blah. And and ultimately, it's just not like you said. They're just seals clapping. There's no actual right. reporting. There's no news or or substance any uh, with, with any of this. Um, very quickly, Ken, because we're we're uh, we're fast approaching the end, and I I, I think yeah. I would be remiss if I didn't uh, ask you. Uh, you were recently in Venezuela. You're also writing a, a new book on Venezuela, and uh, they're just you know I was concerned uh, the other day when I saw uh, the so-called ambassador, uh, the Venezuelan ambassador to the U.S. Uh, uh, Vecchio. Um, <clears throat> Uh, you ask U.S. Southern Command for assistance, uh, and of course, uh, little Marco Rubio got super excited about this prospect. Oh, um, by the way, one of the blockbusters we're working on involves my dear friend Marco Rubio. Yeah, no, I, I saw that you had written that the other day, and I was uh, I'm eagerly awaiting uh, anything with oh, Marco it, Rubio. It's going to be a sweet story, <laughs> not for Marco, but for yeah, me. right. <laughs> yeah. Um, any any kind of quick thoughts though on on Venezuela or is the situation just too fluid? I I, I it just seems I go back and forth between uh, it's going to get really bad or it's getting a little bit better. But uh, just your your final thoughts on it. Well, I wrote at the New Republic uh, a month ago or six weeks ago. I lose track of time. I was just out of town for I was traveling uh, around uh, the Middle East and Africa for a month. So it must have been two months ago. I went to uh, Caracas and to Venezuela and. February. I wrote why the coup will fail in the Republic. Um, and I still think it's going to, but you know, but, but it is not a safe prediction. Um, but you can read that story in new Republic and read Washington, Babylon, Caracas Chronicles, where you can see my on the ground reporting, which just does not compute with what the mainstream press reports. I was all around the barrios of Caracas and I did not see people starving. I was fed in people's homes. It's a very dire situation, largely caused by U.S. economic sanctions. I'm not a fan of the Maduro government, by the way. Let me say that. Um, uh, He's not a good guy. Hugo Chavez, his predecessor, is one of my heroes. I would prefer a younger, more progressive socialist um, uh, be in charge, somebody I could support. But between Maduro and the opposition, you're stuck for the moment with Maduro. Um, because the opposition is real scum. Um, so I don't think the coup is going to work. The danger is um, uh, that there is uh, U.S. direct U.S. military intervention. Look, this is easy. This is like Iraq pre-2003 invasion. They squeezed the country. Mm-hmm. Madeleine Albright famously said, yeah, it was worth killing half a million Iraqi kids with sanctions. They don't give a shit. The sanctions don't hurt Maduro. He still eats well, but they do hurt ordinary Venezuelans. 
So they just squeeze the economy like they did in Chile in 73. Actually, you know, like, let's make the economy scream is what I believe it was Kissinger who said that one of the vile people who put Pinochet in power, um, U.S. officials. Um, and then you try to bribe the military. I'm sure they offered some military officers a home in Miami and a couple of million dollars in the Swiss account if they would take out Maduro. But there's a very tight click around Maduro. So that hasn't worked. The sanctions haven't worked. Um, the U.S., you know, nobody in Venezuela, even if they hate the government, wants to be run by the U.S. government and wants a hand-picked puppet. So I don't think, and again, you know, I could be wrong. I don't think they're going to get rid of Maduro um, unless there's direct U.S. military intervention. Because Colombia can't do it. Colombia would, but Colombia can't do it alone. And Brazil, the right wing, I mean, Bolsonaro is evil, but the Brazilian military said we will not take part in the invasion of Venezuela. Mm. Zero, they said that, that they didn't say they said like I'm paraphrasing, but the, the the official who said it said something like it's not 99 percent. No, it's 100 percent. No, <laughs> they, you know, and so so, you know, you can't build the bullshit coalition. They did like Saddam Hussein was an evil, vile man. But, you know, Iraq hasn't done so well since Gaddafi was an evil, vile man. These guys and, you know, Libya is now like not even a state. Um, Maduro is not in that category. He is not a stupid man, and I do believe he's a corrupt man. Um, I don't believe he's, uh, you know, he's in some, he has some admirable qualities. He was a trade union leader. Um, he's not as charismatic as, as Chavez, who also was not a perfect man. None of us are. We don't, there are no perfect men or women, you know. Mm. Um, but um, Maduro, who I, like I said, I'm not a big fan of his, but he's not, I'm not trying to compare him to Saddam and uh, Gaddafi because he's not in that league. Um, I'm just saying, you know, U.S. led overthrows of governments tend not to go as predicted. You know, Iraq turned out not to be the cakewalk that the neocons predicted. And so even if there's a direct U.S. invasion, which I think is the only way they'll get rid of the government, um, uh, you know, uh, or, you know, green, but like an assassination or something. And I, I don't even know, like, the, yeah. I, I don't think they can do it with that direct, but I think the aftermath, you know, remember the famous picture of the, uh, statue of Saddam Hussein toppled that was yes. largely set up like the Iwo Jima, uh, right. Oh yeah. Famous, totally, yes. totally staged. Totally set up. I mean, you might see, I, you know, Venezuelans are tired and some people will welcome Maduro's ouster. There's no question about that. I think he's more popular than the opposition just because the opposition is so disgusting. But, you know, I, I don't believe that the U S can impose a puppet regime. Um, they may be able to briefly, but it's not going to be popular and it's going to be, if they do it, it's going to be a disaster. I'm sure the Pentagon is telling them, are you out of your minds? Mm. You know, Hey, I want to see Marco Rubio's kids go off to die in Venezuela, okay? Yeah, or yeah. Elliot Abrams or John Bolton's. I don't even know if they're capable of breeding. I don't know their, you know, what's the <laughs> size of their families. But, you know, why don't their kids go die? Because I told, I have children. And I have said, uh-uh, you're not going to die in an overseas war. Unless it's World War II um, and you're fighting Nazis. You're <laughs> not going to go and die overseas on behalf of this crooked, you know, Trump administration or for the Obama administration, for that matter, for the U.S. government, if it is a overseas miscalculation or criminal enterprise, my kids are not dying. Let let Elliot Abrams send his kids. Let Bill Crystal send his kids. Let Donald Trump send his kids. Let Barron enlist. He's a little young, but send him off to war. My kids are not going to die in Venezuela, I can assure you. Well, on that note, we are going to wrap it up here. I want to thank Ken Silverstein very much for coming on the show. I would love to have you back on uh, anytime, really. Basically, just let me know. Once again, you can go to WashingtonBabylon.com to read more uh, from uh, work by Ken and many others. Definitely encourage people to check it out. Uh, thank you all so much for listening, and I'll be talking to you very soon. Great, and I'll just last in closing. You, if you don't want to donate to Right to Washington Babylon, exactly, donate to my investigation of Marco Rubio. 
Absolutely. Yes, please go do that, everybody. <laughs> well, thank you thank all you. so much for listening, and I will be speaking to you all very soon. Oh, 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 oh,